Um, thank you for starting the recording. Um, just want to note that we are working with um, one of our one board member, Lisa Grout. Hopefully, she'll be able to join us soon. But if she's not able to, um, want to be sure that everyone feels comfortable um, moving to table an item if anyone feels it's important to wait until we have everybody present and participating. Um, the first item of business is the review and adoption of the agenda. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Mike? Uh, I move to table item. 10 but uh possible revisions to the board election of board officers protocols i'm did not do my homework to talk to, i need to talk to joel first about his comments and suggestions so table that for another session is there a second i'll second it great any discussion about tabling that item all those in favor, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. Got you, Gio. Thank you. It was unanimous. I would also like to add an item to um, continue for the board to determine whether or not we wish to continue meeting without a physical location through June of 2024. Um, is there a second for that? I'll second. Any discussion about that item? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, is there any public comment? I just admitted Lisa. Oh, great. There she is. Well, Lisa, transition. Hey, Hi, Lisa. Congratulations. Hi. <laughs> Beyond my technical skills. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> it was a challenge. Sorry. Uh, we're on item three on the agenda, Lisa, accepting public comment. I see no members of the public, but if anyone wishes to make a comment, <clears throat> now is the time. All right, uh, approval of the minutes of January 4th, 2023. I would welcome a motion for that. I'll make a motion. Since I'm here, Lisa moved approval of the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second that. That's Geo. Thank you, Geo. Is there discussion of the minutes of the January fourth, twenty twenty three meeting? Joel. I'm I'm looking uh, at the uh, short paragraph about the review of the conflict of interest policy, and this may be elevating form over substance, but uh, but uh, the minutes. Uh, as provided uh, state that the board noted the difference of opinion between the VSBA appointees and the Vermont NEA appointees. And that may in fact have been the case, but we didn't characterize our discussion as VSBA appointees or Vermont NEA appointees. And it seems to me that this uh, portion of the minute should merely read the board discussed the conflict of interest policy and made no decision to change it. So I guess I'll make a motion to amend that paragraph accordingly. I'll, I'll second that. Ms. Geo. Thank you, Geo. Uh, Bobby Joe, did you get that motion? That changed clearly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Any discussion on the change of the minutes? Change to the minutes. 
Hearing none, all in favor of approving the change to the section on the, of the minutes on the annual review of the conflict of interest policy, please say aye and raise your hand if you're on screen. Aye. aye. This is Gio, aye. Thank you, it's unanimous. Any other discussion? I'll turn back to the main motion approving the minutes. Any other discussion about the minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes of January 24, January 4th, 2023, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 This is Gio, aye. Thank you, you've approved the minutes. Um, I'm gonna insert the board meeting procedures right here really quickly and hopefully it'll be less than five minutes. Um, when we met um, either in October or January, we took action to continue meeting until, it must have been October, until January of 2023 without a physical location, which was what was allowed by law at the time. In January of 2023, the legislature extended the opportunity for public bodies to meet virtually without a physical location through June of 2024. Um, if, a, if a body chooses to do so, they need to record the meeting and make sure that the public has notice and the opportunity to participate by phone. Um, I'm guessing that folks would like to continue to meet remotely and or we may decide to meet in person at some point for a particular reason, but um, would like to um, continue that um, absent a specific decision not to. If that's the case, would someone be willing to make a motion to do that? I'd make a motion. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, Susan. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Lisa made that motion and Suzanne seconded it. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of continuing to meet without a physical location through June of 2024, please say aye and raise your hand. Aye. aye. This is GOI. Thank you. All right, the next item of business is reviewing upcoming contracts. Bobby Joe, is that something, or John, is that something you're prepared to uh, walk us through? Uh, not it. <laughs> Did you know? <laughs> uh, I got it. So on, on page two of the, of the uh, packet, it, there is a list of the upcoming contracts. Um, you don't have to refer to it, but I just want you to know it's there. Um, so it's really more of an FYI at this point that they're coming up um, to review. None of them are ready for review or approval at this point. Um, so I will just quickly go through. Um, we have the Vermont NEA service, con service agreement um, coming due for July 1st. Um, the VISBIT is not technically due until um, 2025. Uh, the Vistas contract is good through 2023. Our Blue Cross contract um, will be good through June uh, 30th uh, through to uh, July 1st this year. Um, we are beginning the conversations with them and starting to, you know, kind of highlight areas we might want to change a little bit of, specifically um, regarding the payment integrity program that they've introduced to us. Uh, but we're not ready to move forward with that contract at this time. Remedy is good until 24, and our Gallagher contract is coming due um, for July 1st as well. Um, we haven't spoken with Gallagher at this point, but we wanted to just let you know that these are these are the ones that are coming up due. And if anyone had anything in particular they wanted to mention about any of these contracts, we're happy to take that back during our discussions and negotiations with these vendors. Joel? Bobby Joe, you, you may just have added words to a sentence, but, but regarding the VISBIT contract, you said something on the order of it's not technically due until right, it did 25. Auto, I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. So it, it did an auto renewal um, July 1 of 22 and is good through uh, 25 at this point. If we wanted to 
so at this point it's it's fine so i guess i didn't really mean to say technically okay um, that's I, fine. I think it's I just understand. because it was an auto roll it, yeah. Yeah. All right. believe it or not i actually understand what you just said <laughs> <laughs> all right i'll zip it then <laughs> so i guess but by the way in case in case you guys lose me our, our power has been flickering on and off all day so i expect to go down at any moment so <laughs> oh we get it <laughs> others have had the same issue so <clears throat> So just to reiterate, if we lose someone, hopefully anyone who loses power might be able to try and rejoin by phone. And if that doesn't work, um, we will, the plan is for us to continue to meet with the understanding that um, anyone can table any items for a future meeting if we feel like it's not appropriate to continue without all members of the board present. And if we have any significant disruptions, we'll end the meeting and move these items to the May meeting. Okay. Um, but back to contracts, um, I had a quick question. Are you going to give us an update in the management updates on the Blue Cross conversations and things like payment integrity is that the plan uh yes for what we know there's some things that are still um okay. in the works but yes we will okay but the key reason this is on the agenda is this is our chance if there are any significant changes we want to make to contracts um, or initiate as part of contract renewal this is our chance to bring them up any board members have any Sounds like management team isn't proposing any big changes. We're not at this time, no. Okay. All right. Um, hearing, seeing no hands, hearing no questions, I'll move on to the uh, Vermont NEA quarter four 2022 quarterly update. I'll begin by saying thank you for sharing that with us. Questions or comments or Mark, are there any highlights you wanna wanna point out? No, I think the document speaks for itself. If it doesn't, please let me know. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. Thank you. Mike. Thanks, Tracy. Yeah, Mark, thanks as always for writing that up. It's it's always an informative read for me. Um one of the things that I was doing is looking at, um, because of the, the, the notice about upcoming contracts, is I was reviewing the Vermont NEA service contract. And I noticed that there were, like, I think there were nine points. Hey, here's what, here's what's in scope. Here's the, uh, the things that are, that the NEA is supposed to do under this contract. It would be helpful for me to organize your reports by those items so I can see how how you're doing against each one of those things. Does that make sense? Let me take a look, okay? And I'll let you know. Okay, thank you. Mike, that sounds like a good idea to me as well. This is Gio. I think that would be uh, helpful as well. And Mark, are you still out of power at this point? Yeah, I am. Yeah, so he won't be there right now. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not expecting it right now, yeah. Just saying, uh, you do it quarterly, right? So, so you're doing another, you're prepping another one. Yeah, by the end month. of this month, I've got to yeah. do another one. Okay, and reach out to me if you have any questions. Reach out to me. We can always chat. Sure. Happy Thank you, to. sir. Great. Anything else on the report? Would we like to formally act to accept the report? So moved. Mike, move that we accept the quarter four 2022 report from Vermont NEA. Is there a second? Lisa seconded that. Is there any discussion? Uh, Joel? It's not, it's not about the report. It's always about, I can't get straight, why it is that we accept reports or approve reports or adopt reports. This is simply a submission uh, to the board, and I, I'm not sure that what, what would happen if we didn't accept it. I, I, it's just a procedural issue for me. It's not a big deal. We can vote on it and accept it, but I would like to sort of 
understand at some point why we bother. Mike? Um, we don't adhere to the policy governance framework, but my, my last school board does. And in that framework, the reports are very important because they're evidence that that the executive or somebody is doing something. And so it you're right, it doesn't really make a difference if you uh oh. That'll fix them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. For those who can't see, Mike has frozen <laughs> in time and place. At least it's not a winter scene behind him. I just not him. So he's back. Yeah, there right. he is. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know what the last thing you heard was. <laughs> it was very, it was very pungent, though. <laughs> we we heard that. That's all from you. That uh, I'm finished talking. That's the. Like, <laughs> <Yeah. no. laughs> I think I think accepting voting to accept a report is a nice formal way to to uh, to show that the board says yes, you've done that that you're reporting on. All right, I, 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 it was a comment, not not a mm -hmm. uh, not a motion of any sort. That's fine, Mike. I appreciate that uh, response. Thank you. Any further discussion? All those in favor of. Uh, accepting the report, please say aye and raise your hand if you're on screen. Aye. aye. This is GOI. Thank you very much. All right, the next item is financial updates. Chris. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so in your packet, you have a memo um, that I drafted to outline some of the highlights, as well as the first document uh, statement would be our combining statement of revenue, expenses, and change in net position or AKA income statement. And then, um, so we'll start with the income statement. There is not, just as an overview, there's not a lot going on here, nothing unexpected. I, you know, it's the kind of financial statements I love to see. Um, you know, things are, things are normal, things seem to be trending within Blue Cross Blue Shield expectations. And, um, you know, we're actually losing a little bit of money on dental, which is within our expectations as well. So um, pretty um, status quo report, but I will certainly go through it. Um, when you're looking at our revenue, our revenue is down 11% over last year. You know, that was expected as the Vistas retiree population left the program. So we would certainly expect to see revenues down. The claims related expenses are also down uh, overall by 8%. And again, you know, that's being driven by uh, Vistas population leaving. You know, if we were looking at the same population, um, our, our claims would be up. Yes, Bobby Joe. Is there anybody that would like me to share this on the screen that doesn't have it in front of them? Would that be helpful for anybody or everybody good? Okay, all right. <clears throat> Carry on. Sure, no problem. Um, when you come down to general operating expenses, you know, uh, those are down 8% as well. Uh, you know, mostly being driven again by, that's the, sorry. General operating expenses are up 18%. And that makes sense, you know, with inflation and everything else, but we're still within what we budgeted. And then overall, the operating expenses are down 8%. And that's, again, being driven by claims, by claims there. Um, interest income, we're doing uh, better this year. Last year, we were looking at 208,000 this time of year, we're up to 557. So the market is starting to come back, which is good. We're starting to see a little bit more dividends there. And market change is actually down. At this time last year, we were a positive 329,000. Now we're at a negative 436,000. However, um, as of 228, we're basically flat with market change. So I don't expect, you know, it's hard to say what's going to happen as of June 30th, but the trend we're seeing right now is that things are sort of leveling out um, on our, and you know, the majority of our investments are in bonds. So we are in a less volatile position in VHI than we would be if we had uh, 
uh, further investments in the equity market. You know, bonds have fluctuated as well, but um, but they're less less active. Um, but actually, right now, equities are helping us, and uh, bonds are still down a spot. Any question on expenses or the income statement? Okay, so I'll move forward just quickly looking at our net position on our balance sheet. Uh, we're up 15% over last year, so that's doing well. Um, looking at a year-to-date gain on the, or a year-to-date loss on the health program of 2.2 million and a small loss on the dental program of 153,000. So, you know, we're, we're showing a little bit of a loss, but it's not a unexpected loss. As I mentioned, you know, we're trending as the actuaries would have expected. The loss on the health program, um, you know, we're at 1231. So we've been at the time where the claims liabilities are, are more on the VHI side, deductibles reset, cost sharing resets on January 1st. So I tend to see a little bit of a dip, a little more of a loss as of 1231. And then January and February claims are a little less. So that comes back up a spot. Um, so I think we're in, a, we're in a good position, even though we're a little bit off to where we were last year. But last year we ended with a large gain. So um, I, think, I think we're still in a good place. Uh, the budget to actual, uh, this is the, you know, the fully expanded version of all your expenses you know, that's summarized on your income statement. You know, again, budget-wise, we're, we're on target. We've spent 52% um, of our claims-related expenses. We've spent uh, only 31% of our general operating expenses, uh, wellness expenses in that range as well. So uh, everything is trending on budget as we expected. So any questions overall on our finances or our financial position? Mike? Yeah, thank you for this, Chris, as always. Um, you said in your note, you expect to gain about 500K for FY23. Um, yes. Is that, now right now the markets are kind of crazy, right? They're a little volatile right. and, right. you know, you wrote this before the whole Silicon Valley bank thing happened. Right. Um, do you have any any thoughts? Are you still in that general sense that we'll still be in the black a little bit for, for the year? Yeah, I, I when I speak to that, I mean, I'm thinking more on the operations because that's really what I can project. You know, I, I can see how our claims trends are comparing to what we expected and our operating expenses. You know, the market, it's hard to say, Mike. I mean, you know, it, if if I had that that knowledge, I would not be in this job. <laughs> you know, I... I'd be rich, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, so, so I kind of, when I make those comments, I think I speak, I'm thinking I'm speaking more to, to the operating, but, you know, market, market does seem pretty flat right now overall. So unless we have another big hit or another big problem, I still think we should be okay. You know, we're in, we're in bond funds, we're in equity funds that mirror the entire market. Um, so unless the, the whole bond market makes a dramatic turn I, I think we're we're we'll be fine as far okay as so that's that's really informative thank you so when you're talking about looking at the claims you're comparing them from year to year right so you're yes. you're seeing okay all right thank and you. also to what the actuaries projected yeah for this year so to see if it's sort of trending as i would expect um they don't give me a month to month to month what i could expect but just looking at it in terms of the historical, how we set, tend to trend our claims through the year, what the cycle looks like, where we ended, where we expect to end, you know, sort of evaluate that whole picture to, to see if uh, I think something is going awry um, and I'm not seeing that. So. Okay, great. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions or comments on the financials? So the next item for me to talk a little bit about was the FY24 budget update. And so we're working on that now. Um, we'll have 
Uh, I'm sure the Vermont NEA is developing their number. Bisbet is developing our number. Uh, I know Bobby Joe is looking at so, you know the, the some of the direct be high program expenses with Mark. And uh, you know, so we're in the kind of the preliminary stages of the budget. We'll plan on bringing you a budget next meeting in May. Uh, but if there's anything on the board's mind at this point, I would appreciate any input, um, you know, anything that they're saying you that you're thinking that we haven't budgeted for in the past, a new initiative, anything that you're thinking of that that you would like to see us include. I would love to hear that so that we can incorporate that for you. Yeah, this is Gio. I think Joel's mentioned this before, but a, a slush fund for the board to travel to Jamaica for our meetings. <laughs> I don't think that meets my fiduciary responsibility. <laughs> damn, damn. Okay, well, I dropped that then. Okay. <laughs> Pretty sure Mark and John and I just had a similar conversation about what about doing a retreat. <laughs> but fine. I would just say looking at the future topics list, and maybe as we discuss it at the end of the meeting, if there are resources that the management team needs in order to support um, the things that we're thinking about going forward, um, I would encourage you to consider that as you're developing a budget proposal for us. And again, note that we'll be talking about future topics further at the end of the meeting. So. Um, okay. okay. All right. Before we entirely leave the financials, do we want to take action to accept those just to be to continue the trend? Would somebody be willing to make an, a motion to accept the financials? The financial report? Geo so moved. Uh, Geo seconded. All right, Mike moved and Geo seconded. Is there any further discussion on the financials for Q2 of FY23? Seeing none, all those in favor of accepting the report, please say aye and raise your hand if you're on screen. Aye. Aye. Geo, aye. Great, thank you. It was unanimous. So the next piece is the change in auditors, Chris. Okay, so we will be bringing you um, or John. The, so we'll be bringing you the engagement letter uh, next meeting as well. Uh, but just to give you a heads up of what's happened, I think uh, maybe some of the board is aware. The I'm not sure at what level everybody's at, but um, but the uh, Selen and Powers uh, contacted us. And they have undergone some reorganization. They had some people leave. Um, a couple of key partners are changing their roles. And they just no longer have the capacity um, or the staff to support our audits. Wow. So, um, you know, it's we've been with them for a long time. But, you know, change can be good. So we'll embrace this. Um, I know as boards, we talk about whether we should change auditors from time to time. So uh, this is this is the time. What, what, yes. When did when did we learn of this? Um, I found out about a month ago. Okay. I think they, they called me and let me know. I, th um, I, think I think it was about a month ago. And then we started talking to other firms and other pools and other leagues and Yes. Yeah. So, so we did our research, um, like John mentioned, talked with other pools in the industry, talked with the League of Cities and Towns, uh, spoke with Sullivan Powers also to see if they had a recommendation of uh, firms that would be a good fit for us. And we landed on Johnson Lambert. They have an office in Burlington and they're um, actually a nationwide firm. They, they have uh, offices in many states. What's nice about this particular firm is they are 85% devoted to auditing only. So they really, that is really their firm's focus, not taxes or some other item. And 88% of their business is either pools or insurance. 
So they really, really focus on our industry. So I think we're going to get a very good audit um, because of the skill set that they bring to the table. Uh, the league does use Johnson Lambert. The um, there's a couple of pools in New Hampshire that use them. Everything, every, all the references were were very good, and uh, so we have um, the Visbit board actually engaged last night for this uh, arrangement. I will say that unfortunately the fee structure is higher. Um, we did talk with them about that to see if we could bring those fees down a spot. It's a combination of a couple of factors. One thing is, is that uh, Sullivan and Powers did not feel the need to go into Blue Cross and actually audit claims. Uh, they relied on the SOC 1 reporting and they feel that because claims really drives our financial statements that they would like to go into Blue Cross Blue Shield and do uh, a sampling, do some auditing of those claims <laughs> processes. So that is part of it. The other part of it is just uh, general inflation. Uh, like Sullivan Powers was dealing with, they, they uh, communicated as well. Finding CPAs right now is really, really, really difficult. And uh, they're having trouble filling positions, support positions. So they're having to pay more to retain staff. And, you know, even if we had been with Sullivan and Powers, I think we would be looking at a pretty large increase this year. It's just the way things are going. So just to give you a heads up, they quoted us. We were paying 25.5 with Sullivan and Powers for our audit. The revised quote, we our first quote was a 64% increase. So we we did we did bring them down, but we're looking at a range of 30 to 36,000 and then another 1360 for the VHI tax return. So it's it's basically a 25 to a 48% increase in fees depending on where we fall um, as time allows. But honestly, I think we're gonna be at the high high end of this. Um, and they even said if during the audit, they felt that they needed more hours, they would talk to us. So we were able to bring them down from their original quote, but I think they're a little um, tentative about that. Um, so I would expect we're gonna be at the high range of that. So any questions? Jonathan? I, I would just add, I think um, we're fortunate that because of Vermont's insurance regulations that they have this office in Vermont and the person who's our lead auditor is probably, I would say Johnson Lambert's the lead auditing firm across the country for pools. So we have them in our backyard and to have them able to meet our dates and deadlines and to do this work. I've, I've talked to people that use, use the firm and they said they're very fair, they're very thorough, and, and they will dig into things. So, um, you know, while we hate to lose a long-term partner, I think we landed pretty well with Johnson Lambert. I'd rather go with somebody unfair and, you know, losing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we appreciate the update and um, look forward to more information at the next meeting. Any other questions about the audit? All right, let's do management updates. Okay, so I think I'll start in on the items that um, that I can speak to, and then obviously John and Mark can hop in if I miss anything or if there's more to add. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, we are having conversations with Blue Cross about you know a few different things actually. One of them is the payment integrity, and that program I think we brought to you and at least brought up a few months ago, which is basically they asked us to commit to a payment integrity program in order to keep our um, our administrative costs down. Um, they indicated we would be looking at a 10% increase in admin um, if we didn't kind of go if we um, if we were to just take the the increase that was needed. Um, so they came up with a, an idea to do a 2% increase to admin, but do an increase on the um, on the payment integrity side, which is 
really where they um, focus on things like fraud, waste, and abuse, um, auditing, you know, claims, audits, and claims um, editing. So different ways that they can save money by <clears throat> reducing costs to us. And they, um, ag we agreed with them to that they would cap it at um, 30%. So where we used to retain the majority of that money, instead they're keeping 30% of that. Um, we agreed to do that with the understanding that we wanted uh, reporting um, so that we could see how that was working and we wanted um, additional information on what was changing and what they were doing to expand their programming in order to make this uh, more beneficial. Um, what they had told us in their initial proposal was they were going to be increasing the program in order to generate more revenue. So we were actually going to come out still ahead of where we were today, even though they were be keeping 30%. So they're working on the language to that to put in our contract. Um, and Mark, was there any more to that uh, for the payment integrity? I think you, I think you uh, captured it nicely. I would just add that, um, as Bobby Joe noted, Blue Cross has an obligation now by contract to perform at a very high rate of competency in respect to administrative excess, waste, fraud, abuse, proper claims auditing. What payment integrity essentially does, it's a vehicle by which the carrier, if you will, incentivizes itself to be even better at this work, um, which could be a little odd actually, but it is apparently commonly done now across the insurance market. When we researched it, we discovered that it had as a model, as a concept, had really begun to take off uh, in the private insurance market. So think of the carrier as making investments in particular technologies, potentially even staff, in order to incentivize itself to be even more effective um, at this work. And in exchange for that, it gets to you know keep some of the proceeds that come from this work if it's successful, and we get a much lower uh, admin rate than would otherwise have been the case. And we said to Blue Cross that we're willing to engage in this for the next two years on a pilot um, basis. And as Bobby Joe said, we are waiting for language from them because we also want to see in very plain uh, and direct language the metric and evaluation systems and processes Blue Cross is going to be used is using or will use to run the payment integrity model and also to justify to us what the savings are so that we can assess if it's a really viable um, project and if it's something we want to continue with in the future. Finally, the last thing I would add is that one of the reasons we are seeing a, um, or would have seen a very significant increase in admin costs in addition to inflationary pressures and rising costs across the system um, Blue Cross has lost a significant number of lives in its book of business over the last several years. So there are fewer bodies, if you will, uh, to spread the cost of their administrative expenses. And uh, that's also obviously a fact that we're going to have to monitor as we move forward. What, what I was surprised by when we were doing our research is that as private equity makes moves into the health care system, buying doctor's practices, et cetera, the lengths that people will go to. There's actually workshops on coding, how to upcode and how to upsell and get more out of insurance. And so what this does is it's Blue Cross is getting a software program that actually goes in and looks for these types of things and gets that money out, looks for fraud and abuse. But it's just become such a high tech way to squeeze as much money out as possible. So this is our way to get some of that back. And honestly, yeah, in some respects, this is like the battle of the algorithms. Yeah. Right. It's similar to Remedy. That's what I was going to say, Mark, too, is, you know, Remedy does this work for us. Blue Cross is kind of doing this, this work for us as well. So um, it's good to be able to use the vendor that already has the information as opposed to hiring a third party, um, <clears throat> which just means sharing more data. And um, mm -hmm. so I think this is a, was a good, a good move for us um, in order to keep our admin down <clears throat> because there was no way <laughs> we would have... Uh, Accepted, right. honestly, a 10% increase on our admin. So I'm wondering if you foresee an impact on subscribers. Certainly, it's the right thing to do to look for 
waste and fraud and things like that. But I do worry about subscribers feeling caught in the middle between um, providers and the insurance company if there's differences of opinions. Certainly that never came up with pharmacy, I don't think. I wonder if this will feel different. It shouldn't, yeah, and I, you know, I, th yeah. I think I think Mark would be um, the first one to to catch that as well. But um, we don't expect that because typically when these things are done, these are um, agreements that are in place that are hold the member harmless, um, that are taking them out of the middle. So, would you agree with that, Mark? Yeah, I would. And I think where the rubber hits the road on this, Tracy, is usually between the carrier and the providers, or a carrier and a hospital. We we actually have. Bobby Joe, I can't recall a fraud case um, in recent memory involving a member that you and I had to intervene with or that I had to. No. And in respect to claims auditing, that is a conversation that's generally going to happen between Blue Cross and providers. So our members shouldn't feel any difference as a result of this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And the good news is that it doesn't impact things like prior approvals or, you know, whether things get um, approved or not. This is really about um, upcoding and, you know, charging for individual items instead of combining them into one one package, one bundle. It's, it's after the fact. Mike? So if it's after the fact, I like I like this idea. Right. And, and, and Mark, I totally agree about all the algorithms. Um, if if there is a finding, if Blue Cross does find something and something was upcoded or something like that, is the is the resulting financial benefit to the program to VHI or is it direct? Does it does it go back to the member at all? It's really if both. The member would, yeah, correct. Go ahead, Bobby. Go. Sorry, it's hard not seeing what you, Mark. <laughs> um, no, it, it's really right. both. It's both, Mike. So it's both whoever would be responsible for that claim. So the the program um, is no is no longer charged. So say they want tried to charge two hundred dollars for something that really should have been a hundred dollars. The program um, is benefited. The HRAs that the employers paying are benefited, and then the members on the back end, if they have any. Um, dollars do would be benefited. So, so it's that individual transaction. It's not. So I guess I was asked a little, I'll, I'll re-ask. So it doesn't come back as a bulk. Hey, we saved this amount of money that we're going to give back to, to the to the plan or the program. It's actually each individual transaction that may be backed out or, or adjusted. Yeah, it's very well, incremental. Actually, Mike, it... Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, it's Mark, sorry. Well, I think it's actually both, Mike. I mean, one of the things we want to see from Blue Cross, and this we hope will be in their language, is, again, how they're going to run this program and how they're going to justify to us that they have actually upped their game and been more successful in eliminating fraud waste than being sharper on the claims auditing side of things. And as John said, fighting these upcoding technologies that are everywhere now in the business. Uh, so we want to make sure that when we sign on the dotted line around payment integrity, that the Blues are actually going to deliver what it is they've promised. And we want to know what that 30% actually amounts to and how they arrived at it. Yeah, I'm so very I much in agreement with that. I, I, I've been part of on, on the IT and like telecom side, similar things. And it's all in the how, how does the, the how does the money flow back and how is it calculated is 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 the details that are super important. So I'm glad you guys are on on in that same on that same page. Thanks. Um, any other questions on that piece before we go to the next thing? Um, we did. I think we talked briefly about Hinge Health a few um, a few meetings back, which is basically a physical ther a way of doing physical therapy in a virtual world. Um, it was something that we were really interested in doing, but we hadn't finalized with Blue Cross, and it turned out to be okay because they weren't quite ready in the from the contract perspective. So we are looking at a seven one launch on that, and if I think and if if you think. Um, if it's something that you're interested in hearing more about specifically, we'd be happy to um, have it uh, presented to you in May when we come when we come to this meeting. Um, if you are comfortable with just kind of a highlight, that's fine too. Um, but we are intending to move forward, and we're looking at a July one uh, date for that. Any 
So if, if anyone's interested and we can we can table that till later if anyone's interested in hearing, you know, more specifically on how that plan works and, and what that looks like for a member, um, we're happy to bring someone to um, to describe it for you. Both of our filings health and dental were approved. I'm sure you know that at this point. Um, as far as Vistor's renewal timing, uh, so we just last year, um, you know, we had a lot of back and forth with Vistor's and the the due date for their rates was kind of a drop dead date of October 1st. Well, they were actually trying to get their renewal out on or around October 1st as well. So it really was tight for them. So they asked us if we could bump it back um, so that they had more time between the approval time and to get that actual renewal out. So we did work with Blue Cross and with DFR and we did get approval to go back 30 days. So basically everyone's adjusting their schedules to go back 30 days so that they'll have their approved rates by September 1st instead of by October 1st, um, which gives them uh, more wiggle room to get, get that renewal out. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we noticed this year, because, you know, in years past, we had that subsidy dynamic that was happening between the over 65s and the under 65s, and that's gone now. Um, so when we sent them their kind of their renewal timeline, it, there's all this back and forth of, you know, who's talking to who when, and um, visitors came back and said, we don't really know if we need all of this back and forth because it, the rates are going to be what the rates are going to be. There's not going to be any of this adjusting or, you know, massaging of the rates. So we may have a much simplified, much more simplified renewal this year, um, but we will be bringing that official renewal to you in May when we get together for your approval. Um, we're, we're hoping for it to be a lot simpler this year. Last year, they took kind of a big gulp at the rate difference difference, and had a 17% increase for folks, which as Mark will tell you was kind of painful for some folks, but that'll be the last time that we have to do that. Um, and then moving forward this year, they really only needed a two or 3% increase, but in order to bring the rates up to where they needed to be, that's why they did this, the full 17. So we're hoping next year, it's just going to be a, a small renewal, uh, or small increase, whatever is needed, um, and then move forward. Any addition on that, Mark? No, you got it. All right, so I will let Mark talk about um, kind of the VBA update because he's um, in it more than we are, <laughs> and then his update on reference-based pricing as well. Well, in respect to Vermont Blue Advantage um, and the Medicare Advantage plans for the Vistas retirees 65 and older, Bobby, Joe, John, and I continue to attend regular monthly meetings with Blue Cross, VBA staff, and of course, Vistas personnel to review projects, problems, prospects for the future, get questions answered, and also to ask for additional information if we've encountered an issue or a problem that we feel needs further study. Um, as I noted in my report in December, I continue to provide information to visitors on growing issues around Medicare Advantage and the overcharging controversy that is drawing more and more attention in the press and also in Washington. What ultimately comes of that is anybody's guess, but there's been more concern of late in the halls of Congress and also at CMS and in the White House <laughs> about off the Medicare Advantage and what that will mean for the Medicare Trust Fund and what it means ultimately, of course, for retirees. I also continue to be the main point person on the management team for retirees who have difficulties with a benefit option through Medicare Advantage, difficulties with providers. Um, we had to intervene on behalf of retirees recently when it became clear that there is a way for providers out of state or in state not to take Medicare Advantage patients. The original understanding we had, and this was shared by visitors as well, is that any provider who took Medicare had to accept a Medicare Advantage patient as well. And when I say Medicare, I meant traditional Medicare as opposed to Medicare Advantage. That, in fact, is, is not the case. Um, there's more wrinkles to all of that. And we brought that, me specifically, because I got contacted about it a few times. We had retirees in Florida um, who received letters from a clinic or a provider practice 
informing them that as of a certain date, they would no longer be accepting Medicare Advantage patients. So when that issue was brought to the attention of DBA and Blue Cross, they went back and did some additional research and discovered that indeed um, there is a way for providers not to accept Medicare Advantage under federal law and regulation. Fortunately, it has been a small problem to date. We have not had many members impacted by this, but consequently, um, BBA and Blue Cross rewrote language or added language to the benefit booklet for VISTA's retirees at our insistence. And they sent us a draft of that language and I revised it in part um, to address what I thought were the salient issues that retirees were calling me about. So we're very much in that mix, helping retirees whenever we can, cooperating with the Vermont Blue Advantage team on as many opportunities as present themselves. The BBA team is um, presented at our retirement workshops this year for the first time. Um, so that's pretty much the Medicare Advantage report. Um, I have a question and a comment. I'll do the comment first. And I meant to email you about this. I'm, a, I'm kind of a health insurance, healthcare coach for a uh, member of my family who's in the Medicare Advantage plan. And um, as your report notes, they found the transition to the new health and, um, pres prescription provider a little bumpy. And I think, and I can't replicate it now, the link on the VBA's website, once you log in as a, as a subscriber to prescriptions is still connected to Express Scripts. It's not been updated as of last week to take you to Optum. Um, That's so, good to know. I, I, I'll drop an I'll drop an email to VBA. I did speak to customer service, and they were less than receptive or owning of the problem. Yeah, um, one of the one of the, one of the things I'm hearing from retirees somewhat consistently is they're not very happy with customer service, and that's because they're dealing with folks in Michigan. Uh, most of the time, they're not dealing with folks here in Vermont. And on occasion, the folks in Michigan, I've discovered, are not always on top of their information. Um, and they've actually gotten better at their job, I've noted, over the last year. Um, it was much rockier in the first three to four months. Uh, but from time to time, members have felt the same way you just did, Tracy, that they didn't quite seem to be as concerned and our right. members are generally accustomed to dealing with the Blue Cross customer service line. And that generally, that's a division of Blue Cross that gets pretty high marks from our members for their responsiveness and their timeliness. Um, right. And I know Vistas Vistas had issues uh, some months back about how long it was taking for members to get help from a service member in Michigan, uh, they were waiting on the line longer than they thought they should have to, and that was the case. And, and the Blues and VBA have addressed that problem. That has gone away. But periodically, I hear the same thing you do. Uh, so I, if you, with your permission, I can, I can send an email to Blue Cross, or I can give you a contact number if you wish to do it directly. Um, no, I'm all set. Just... Um, uh ask that you check into that website link so that subscribers can get directly to their prescriptions. I will do that, thank you. So to that end, my question is, is the administrative amount that we're charging for VBA um, administrative services fair? It seemed like that was a large, that's a large responsibility. So I can, I can my, get you the amount. Yeah, my time is not factored into that. I don't think Bobby Joe is factored into that equation. And I think frankly, it'd be hard to sort of be able to quantify that, but Bobby Joe can speak to the details of the, the charge better than I. Um, yeah, I have it actually right here. Hang on a second. <clears throat> so, it, you know, it's funny because when they ask about, you know, what is administrative cost? you know what what administrative costs you is is this including you know we 
we spend, and it's it's gotten better for John and I, but I know Mark continues to spend a lot of time on this and a lot of time with districts in general. So on a monthly basis, they're paying us 22, almost $23,000 for administrative services, and then another 30,000 for the wellness program. So on a monthly basis, um, for the month of January, uh, they owe us just under $53,000 a month. So I feel like it certainly secures <laughs> um, what we're doing um, for the fact that all of the work that Mark does um, on an individual basis from all, for all of these members, um, along with the financial costs of contracts and things like that that we do with them. So. Okay, thank you. Other questions or comments on the VBA update? Okay. Is there a reference-based pricing update? Yeah, just briefly. Um, Bobby, Joe, and John and I, our, our schedules have been really crazy. Um, in February and even now into March, but we're going to be getting together soon to schedule a meeting with um, Marilyn Bartlett and Chris Deacon to follow up on a conversation we had with you folks at our last meeting. I'd like John and Bobby Joe, again, consistent with that earlier conversation, to talk with Marilyn and Chris, hear their perspective on reference based pricing and its viability and its promise um, so that they are sort of in sync with what I've been hearing and what I've been researching. So we're gonna be setting that meeting up as a management team, probably within the next month, and we'll report out to you um, on where we stand in relationship to that at our next board meeting. I've also had uh, a really interesting conversation with um, a staff person, an analyst in the state of Oregon. As you can note, as you'll note from my quarterly report in December, there are several states now that have pursued an interest in reference-based pricing. They're all doing it a little bit differently. Montana, which started this ball rolling, did so through direct contract negotiations between the state of Vermont's, excuse me, the state of Montana's healthcare pool for state employees and their dependents, about mm -hmm. 31,000 people, um, and 16 critical access hospitals. Oregon, on the other hand, um, instituted reference-based pricing via statute. So it's the law of the land in Oregon for their public sector pools. And there are two of those pools and combined, they account for 300,000 covered lives approximately. So I, I reached out to Oregon to learn more about how they had structured the program, what they were learning, what was working, what wasn't working. And to date, it's been a very effective program. There have been no challenges to it by the hospitals that are affected, and they're mostly large, urban-based, and in some cases, large, semi-rural hospitals that are affected. Some of the really small hospitals in Oregon are exempted from the reference-based pricing statute. And I was also interested to know about the prospective savings, because when I first started researching it, um, Oregon only had a projected savings of $81 million in year one. And that was a projection that occurred prior to COVID. What I learned in the course of talking with the Oregon um, analyst is that their savings in year one, and year one would have been 2021, was $59 million. But that's only because the reference-based pricing requirements or rules only impacted 14% of claims at hospitals. And that's because the hospitals were shut down even more severely than our hospitals were during the worst of COVID and they were shut down for longer. So they had a much reduced volume of care. Consequently, the percentage of claims that would have been affected by a reference-based pricing methodology in that first year was relatively small, 14%. Nonetheless, it reduced costs by $59 million. And in year two, 33% of claims were impacted. Again, that's the tail end of the COVID emergency. So a much lower volume of hospital care because of the pandemic. But with 33% of the hospital claims impacted, 
the reduction in cost in 2022 was $112 million. So to date, with a relatively small amount of claims impacted, Oregon's lowered its hospital costs by about $171 million. And they um, said they'd be happy to let me know what the savings will be in 2023 once they are able to calculate um, <clears throat> that figure. Structurally, administratively, politically, um, it's going very well in Oregon, and they're sort of looking forward to the next stage of that project. So that's my uh, report on reference-based pricing. I'm happy to take any questions, and Bobby, Joe, John, and I will have something to say on the matter at the next board meeting, hopefully. Joel? Uh, Mark, uh, I'm wondering if you, you may not know, but where is the impetus uh, come from in Oregon for legislation? It came from the public sector pools themselves. It came from, again, there's two pools. And Oregon operates the state-based pool structure for public sector employees. And as I said, it has two divisions, the Educators Benefit Board and the Public Employee Benefit Board. And I think they have a joint board where they talk about benefit design and policy and you know cost savings, et cetera. Um, but they are under law to distinct boards and operate their own particular plans. So those boards, I think, um, were very supportive of moving forward. Also the governor and the legislature, um, health, hospital costs there were simply becoming uh, onerous. And the only way they could see to begin to address the problem was through some kind of regulation, and they moved in that direction through um, uh, RVP. Okay, thanks. That's my understanding of its origins. Bobby Joe? Mark, do you know, um, like comparatively to our pool, which is like a $300 million pool, do you know what the size of their pool is? Good question. I only know how many lives they cover. I don't know what their claims is. Okay, so ours, ours is about thirty-four and a half thousand. Um, do you know? Could you tell? You might have said it earlier, and I apologize. But what is their? What is their? Oh no, the educators, the educators benefit board in Oregon has one hundred and fifty-eight thousand covered lives. That would be the equivalent of VHI in Oregon. And then the public employees benefit board, which would be all the other public sector employers who are not affiliated with school districts. They have another roughly 141,000, 145,000 lives, something like that. All right, so they're so at like 320,000 lives? No, 301,000 altogether. Okay, I just, I, I only ask that as a comparison to when we're throwing out numbers like 51 million or, you know, 133 million or whatever, whatever the other one was, just, just as a comparison, size comparison, that obviously theirs is going to be we might still have a significant um, change in dollars, but it's not, it'll never be that significant because it, our pool is not that big. So I just was. Yeah, the closest equivalent to us would be Montana with 31,000 lives when they did it. And they reduced costs by $50 million over the first two years. One five or five and zero? Five zero, 50 million. Okay. And Doug Hopper's report, you'll recall Bobby Joe, specific just to Vermont state employees, if they were to replicate what Montana had done, he projected the savings for the state employees. And their pool is approximately 25,000. It's about 10,000 less than us. He projected their cost savings at $16 million annually. But was that like best case scenario? That's if you achieved, my understanding, I didn't have to go back and read it, but my understanding was, if we did here in Vermont for the state employee pool alone, what Montana had done for its state employee pool, we he projected that the cost would decrease for that pool by $16 million annually. Okay, all right. Just wanted to do a little comparison of numbers. Thank you. Well, Good question. You will do that together before you come back to us and help us make sense of all of that. Brad, yeah, I mean, we questions want... about geography. 
out of state hospitals. You know, it's not Vermont is definitely not Montana. It's not Oregon. It's just you know, it's a much smaller state. We have a lot of concentrations of smaller hospitals and a lot of healthcare outside the state. With Dartmouth being the number one player after the end. Okay. Well, thank you for that update. Any other questions or comments? All right, the next item of business is consideration of appointing a committee to review the conflict of interest policy. A, a board member reached out to Joel and I um, asking about the feasibility of this. And um, so it's on the agenda. Um, just to give context, our bylaws say the board may designate committees, each consisting of not more than three directors and any other persons appointed by the board and a committee shall serve at the pleasure of the board. Um, Suzanne actually reached out and suggested a small two member committee, perhaps of, of somebody like Suzanne and Mike, the, the newer people on the board to review the conflict of interest policy and um, come back with recommendations to the board. Suzanne, would you like to speak about that? Um. Well, when I spoke to to Tracy, um, after I also spoke to Joel, um, my thought was we spent some amount of time at it at my first meeting, and I understand you've spoken about it before, and that as a whole, it seems like we chew up a lot of time over this. But yet, I also believe it's important because I think it represents an underlying premise between the two parties to this board. Um, and perhaps um, two people, perhaps Mike and myself, could talk about it a little bit more in depth away from the board meeting time um, and either answer questions or hammer out some ideas and bring that back to the full board for consideration. Sounds great. This is Gio. <laughs> is that because you're not on it, Gio? <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what way to hide your true motivations, Gio? <laughs> and Mike, would you be willing to serve on that committee? Yes, I would. If we did, well, um, I would welcome a motion to appoint that committee if someone is willing to do that. A motion that we, I'll make a motion. Lisa made a motion that we appoint a committee of two people, Mike and Suzanne, to- Gio, I'll uh, second that. All right, and Gio seconded it. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise their hand and say aye. Aye. This is Gio, aye. Great, it was unanimous. Um, all right, and we're skipping number 10. So um, the- Next item of business is to discuss future agenda items. There is a list on the second page of the agenda. I had a chance to think in advance, but do, do folks have other items that they'd like to see on future agendas? Well, reference-based pricing will be on future agendas. So that, that probably should be added to the list. Yeah, and I was going to take a stab at the, I think it was the whistleblower uh, policy. There were some things I saw when we reviewed it last time. Okay. What about that other protocol? One? Yeah, the, the, the board officer one and not, yeah. Put that on for the future and i'll chat with joel and then um once bobby joe mark and i get a chance to talk about it the uh actuary to help us develop a surplus plan we have the proposal we just need to put that in the budget great and we engage them and the yeah. and the blue cross um algo program uh program is there a name for that uh, payment integrity that sounds so much nicer is that what you were talking about? Yeah. Payment integrity. Okay. Payment integrity. I just want to keep on the radar um, a, re 
a more in-depth review of the dental plan and bringing back those pre-COVID goals of seeing whether we can um, improve that program and improve services to subscribers. And um, the idea of evaluating the new plans now that we have some history with them, including some post or post COVID or new world COVID, new COVID world experience um, with how those new plans are, are playing out. And I didn't know if that had budget implications for things like actuaries. Um, Typically, the work that would be done for that, Tracy, would be done by Blue Cross as far as like pricing out other plans or things like that. So I don't think there's a direct cost. Um, but that is something that Mark and I well, and John have started having at least uh, preliminary conversations on. Right. And dental is definitely on the radar, uh, but we can add all of those to the list. Yep. So just let us know, management team, when you're ready for us to take those up. Any other hopes for the future? Okay, we do have a meeting set for May 15th and everyone should already have the information in their boxes and on, in their calendars. Um, because it's so difficult to schedule, I think the next time we need a meeting after May, absent some emergent need, is September, is that right? And so maybe it would be wise if people don't object to start looking at a September date as soon as um, the management team knows the window that we need to meet for rate setting and what have you, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think the, the only other thing that we, um, that we had to meet for last year in August was setting the annual meeting. Yeah. So one thing that, you know, we could set that um, in May, if I don't think that that's an issue setting it early and we do have the date. So do you want me to put that on the agenda for May? Yes, please. All right, that then we won't have any, yeah. <laughs> we won't need last minute August emails flying around. Perfect. Yep. End of October, late morning. I'm shocked to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Great. So you'll do a doodle poll on September as soon as you have a clear window. Great. Yes, I will. Yep. Speaking, awesome. Tracy, speaking yep. of clear windows, I'm looking out mine and I just want you to know whatever I said before about the snow, we've had at least two, two and a half inches wow. since we've been meeting. So. Wow. <laughs> Finally That's found it. its way to you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, totally, it's totally, you're right. It's totally dumping. <laughs> yeah, that's so that pretty much what you, I meant. Yeah. You can change your background, Mike, <laughs> for all the rest of your meetings. I'm going um, to go cancel my meetings and get my skis on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Awesome. You're, you're not going to go far in this snow, Mike. It's quite sticky. Mm. Yeah, it is. Very sticky. You want to well, build a snowman, you're all set. <laughs> what we say again, Gio? Good for building snowmen. <laughs> what I said. <laughs> Sticky snowman. Well, other than discussing what we'd like to do in the snow, is there any other business for today's meeting? <laughs> Hearing none, I will um, declare us adjourned at 1122. Nice work, everyone. Great. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye.